Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Froskowitz Taylor, and I'm a board member of AEC Accessible. And we have an awesome uh, presentation and fireside chat today. Um, we have Brianna Hughes coming from the West Coast, um, kind of talking about how to get an AEC uh, program started in your district. Um, so I will be following uh, the chat to kind of see if anyone has any questions, and then uh, I'll let Brianna take it over. All right. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's an absolute honor to be here. I'm just amazed at the number of you that have read registered for today's event, whether you're attending live or seeing the recording later. Just know that I really appreciate you, and I hope I can get to your questions as well. So um, again, just to let everybody know the format, I plan to speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then the rest of our time is all devoted to answering your questions. So our topic for today is starting or starting over an AAC program. And this topic came from a conversation that I was having with Anya Anshuri, who is the outreach coordinator for AAC Accessible. And she is helping her organization to create an AAC and AT program basically from scratch. And I've been there and it's hard and I really wanted to help her. And I think many of us as professionals have had the experience of walking into a situation where the AAC or AAT program is not what it should be. Maybe it's a mess because you've got outdated policies to deal with, or maybe it's not a total disaster, but you can see some places where it needs a makeover, or maybe you're in a place where there actually is no AAC program and you're creating one now. So the school district that I work for had an AAC and AT program sort of before I got there, but we also had a lot of problems when I first started. We didn't have a way to provide universal access to high incidence supports like text to speech, speech to text, or audiobooks. We didn't even really have a good process for providing individual access to those things. We had, to my knowledge at least, never had an AAC or AT training for staff before I came in. So I think it's fair to say that awareness was low. And we had some outdated policies like kids were told they couldn't take their devices home with them after school. And I am really proud of how far the district has come. And so I want to share at least the big picture of how we got there so that others can feel prepared to face these kinds of challenges. And if you decide to become an AAC or AT specialist, you, you will meet many kids and adults who should have had AAC and AT a lot sooner. You might meet parents who've been fighting for years to get the right device. You might meet teachers who have been doing whatever they could do with low tech, but they don't have the training or the time to try to design an AAC vocabulary from scratch. We know that this takes decades of research to really design well, and here they are trying to do it with just whatever they can do in their classroom. Teachers also don't have time to be recording the books that they're asking kids to read, although I have met a team of teachers at our middle school who were doing that, bless them, back before we had audiobooks. And you might meet a lot of people who will just simply say, well, I don't think AAC works. You know, why should we spend the money? It's just going to get left on a shelf. And that one really gets under my skin because to me, that's code for I don't think these kids can learn. And they're wrong, of course. I set out to prove it every day and my students do prove them wrong every day. So when I started, I felt like I was going to have to move a mountain. But by the end of my first year of this, I saw that mountain shift just a little bit and I kept going. And it's such a night and day difference between then and now. And yet, even now, I still encounter sad stories, particularly with kids coming to me from other places. We've seen over the last 10 years these huge advances to technology for AAC and to our understanding of how to create a program that works. But the actual implementation of that is still really uneven across the country and also around the world. And so I hope with this podcast, maybe we can reach some of the people who have the power to change things and who want to improve access to robust AAC and ET. I do have to make an obvious disclaimer here. I've only done this once and I can't say that I did it perfectly. Um, and nor can I really say that it's ever done. You know, we're always going to be trying to improve. But I've talked to enough of my fellow SLPs and AAC specialists and AT specialists who either did this for their organization or are starting now that I think the outline I've written for how to do this will apply pretty broadly, at least as far as what to think about. So. This is how to overhaul your organization's AAC program or start it in 10 giant steps. Step one is self-care. We are facing an enormous teacher and SLP shortage. So many of us burned out and left. The rest of us burned out and somehow stayed anyway and are just doing our best to recover. So the first thing I wanna to say to pretty much everyone in the educational profession and in healthcare is that every time you stick up for yourself in terms of your workload, your working conditions, your salary, you are also taking care of your clients. And it should be enough to just be taking care of yourself. But most of us in these 
caregiving helping professions need to hear that it is also taking care of our clients because they need high quality professionals and you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of them. Even before the job, even before the shortage, the job of an AAC or AP specialist was hard and starting a program from scratch is daunting. And I can really easily picture my past self thinking, all right, all right, fast forward to the practical step already. But if I could go back in time, I would tell my younger self, no, hold your horses. <laughs> you need this because you don't know what's coming in 2020 <laughs> or 2022 for that matter. <laughs> so I'm going to say more about the self-care thing and I hope that's okay with you. You will have to fight some imposter syndrome as you're developing this, right? I'm fighting it myself as we speak. And so my best advice is to have a growth mindset for yourself, as well as for the staff that you train and the students or the clients that you serve. Whenever you start to think, I can't do this, try adding the word yet on the end. I can't do this yet. And then you can start, splin start planning your small steps forward. You won't know everything you need to know when you're first starting. You're gonna be learning all the time and that's fine. You just focus on progress over perfection. I have a daily practice of writing down my highlight of the day. What was the most positive thing that happened? And that way on days where it feels like you're not getting anywhere, you can look back and remember, oh yeah, it is getting better. It's just gradual. It's a little bit at a time. I also keep a folder on my desktop called Smiles and there's photos in there of fun moments with my students. Anytime a staff member sends me positive feedback, anytime a parent sends me a thank you note, I save all of those things in one place so that I can go back to it whenever I need to pick me up. And last thing on this point, know that there are others who have gone before you and succeeded. I went to a presentation by Amanda Soper in 2017 at ASHA, and she spoke about her experience in a special education school with over 150 students with complex communication needs, and the vast majority of them had no AAC whatsoever. Nightmare scenario, right? Mm -hmm. In three years, she completely transformed that school. Every child had some form of AAC, and the majority had robust high-tech devices. I still get chills thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And that leads me right into step two, which is to have a mentor if possible. Someone you can talk to when you have questions that I refer to as ungoogleable, the questions that you would have to have a textbook or background experience to know, you just couldn't find it in a search engine. I'd like to take just a moment here to thank my mentors, Regina Hawkins, Sandra Chavardia, Kristen Nemec, if you're listening, and my entire communication works team, because my bosses have been talking about self-care since before it was cool, and since before I knew it was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Step three is to be loud about what you're doing as you're doing it. And that means thanking people publicly for what they do to support you. Email a principal about what your awesome paraprofessionals are doing. Highlight an amazing, news, uh, an amazing teacher in a newsletter that you send out to staff. And don't forget the people in your IT, purchasing, and budgeting departments. These are otherwise thankless jobs that don't involve much, if any, contact with students. So I make a point of going and telling them the happy stories anonymously, of course, that result from all of the many AAC devices that they're helping to fund. Step four is to get organized and stay organized. If you're gonna be creating systems and processes from the ground up, it really helps if you're good with Google Sheets, Drive, Forms, website development, and so on. And in my blog post, I shared some tips for organizing your physical inventory, um, but you'll also want to organize your digital things too, including assessments, consultation notes, and so on. That blog post, by the way, Tana will have the link for you um, if you haven't seen it already. Step five is to know your bureaucracy. So take a look at your policies, understand the legal jargon, and most importantly, get to know the people in charge. What is their vision for this organization and how can you support it? Once you do that, you'll know exactly how to craft your pitch for why policies need to be changed or why funding needs to be acquired and how that supports the larger mission. So for instance, in my district, our mission in Castro Valley Unified is all means all. We're here to educate and empower capital A all students. That's powerful. That means we can't leave anyone out. And my little niche of that mission is to make sure that all students can communicate. So that's how I frame it for my administrators. I talked really early on with administrators from my department at the time, and some of their top priorities were legal compliance, staff training, and reducing the severity of behavior in the classroom. And so I said, yes, yes to all of that. I can help you with all of that. I'm working on getting the IEPs on my caseload to be legally compliant, which means I need devices for them to try so that my assessments will be legally defensible. I can't really say if a device would work or not if I can't offer the student a trial. So could we set up an AAC lending library? I would love to provide staff training for AAC, but they don't have time during their day. Some of our paras are bell to bell. So can we make time for that to happen? Can we find the funding to have additional hours for staff for this? And I know that you know often when kids are having very severe behavioral outbursts, it's 
usually because they don't have a safer way to communicate. So if we can use AAC as a proactive strategy, we can start to move towards that goal. So we talked through all of that and we did all of those things and more. And I had my administration support with it because they understood how I fit into the picture that they were trying to create. Similarly, when I wanted to advocate for audiobooks, I got a hold of our head librarian and I said, hey, do you ever have students or teachers asking you for audiobooks? And she said, yes, and it's such a huge problem because I don't have enough to meet the amount of need that I see and it's so expensive. And so we ended up working together to get universal access to audiobooks for our district, which supported both my students who needed AT because they had dyslexia or other special needs and her students who were English learners or just gen ed students that needed an accommodation. So expanding that team and learning what other folks on your team need can be really helpful. So step six is inventory. You're going to make an inventory of what you have, if anything, and then get a variety of potentially new devices to try with clients or with um, kids. And this is almost certainly going to involve more advocacy. As an AAC specialist, you may, but don't typically have supervisory power over anyone. So we rely on persuasion and on inspiring people. And thankfully we work in a very inspirational field. So it's not hard to find somewhere to draw inspiration from. Um, and if you can tap into that and share it, share your passion for working with these clients, it really helps. If you'd like more details about the inventory piece, like what do I include in my inventory? How many devices do I need to buy? How do I advocate for this? You can check out the blog post that I wrote and that link is now in the chat. Step seven is assessment. You're going to want to start getting people or kids the devices that they need. So this might involve lots of individual assessment. It also may involve mass assessment of the needs of the overall group and just getting a huge number of core boards out into the world. Give people a place to start. If you haven't heard of the specific language first approach, I highly suggest looking into that because it's a way that you can start where you are and then keep building and individualizing from there. Step eight is consultation. And this involves both training your people and then coaching them. And these are two distinct, but both important pieces. Training tends to be like an information dump that happens towards the beginning. And then coaching is what happens when people go to apply that information that you've taught them. So in a first training, I usually talk about what's on the device and what are the main strategies that we're gonna need to know to use it. Things like modeling, things like wait time, um, avoiding over prompting, all of that gets done within that first training session. And then from there, we start working together with the actual client in the room so that we can see how that gets applied in the real world. Because it's one thing for me to speak to a teacher of a preschool student, you know, one-to-one -one in a quiet environment. Totally different thing when you get that kid in a class full of other kids. And then we have to figure out how do we apply this information. So when you're thinking about how to set up your consultation, you don't have to create this entirely from scratch. So there's options like model as a master pal, s'mores, power AAC, simple AAC, impact spelled with AAC in the middle. All of these are acronyms that help to remember all the important strategies that you need to keep in mind when using AAC. And there are many more beyond that. So I will have a set of resource links after um, today that will include links to all of those things. Um, the only reason we haven't provided them in advance is because I know myself, I'll probably come up with more resources as we're talking, and we'll probably add more onto that resource links before you actually see it. Um, another thing that I do to just help myself organize my consultation and materials is I have a website where I store a lot of the videos um, of specific trainings. So I'll have like a 15 minute video about just the organization of Proloquo or just the organization of Touch Chat. And because that's something that gets applied across many different kids and many different staff members. So all of the video trainings get housed there. And then I have a Google Drive that's shared across the whole district with a set of materials that's scalable, basically anything not confidential. So it'll be things like core boards, prompt hierarchies, posters that you can hang in your classroom, um, visuals for the classroom, um, emergency resources, pretty much anything therapy related or classroom related that everybody might potentially need access to will go there. And then each individual kid, I have a folder for them that has their individualized materials as we put those together as a team, separately from the, the main Google Drive. I also try to think about all the ways, different ways that people like to receive information. So some people would prefer to get their information about an AAC device through an email. Some people would prefer to see it on a video. Some people, they're only gonna listen if you're 
catch them there in person. So I kind of try to do all three with everybody. So they all have access to the website. And then I also send out a monthly newsletter for SDC teachers and SLPs. And then a weekly one for the first 10 weeks of the school year for anybody who's new to AAC. So that way it's not an overwhelming amount of emails for either me to write or them to read, um, but enough that folks that need more information get more information and folks that are kind of just continuing to develop their skills continue to get more information as the year goes on. And so once you have all of those kind of training materials and information pieces together, it makes your coaching go a lot more smoothly because when somebody says to you, well, sure, we'd, we'd love to do that, but can we get some low tech in the room? You're like, yeah, you've already got access. It's right there. Just print it, laminate it, go for it. <laughs> it's, it's right there for them where they need it. So then step nine is professional development. You will always need to keep learning and evaluating your progress. And so for me, what helps is to look for patterns of kids that I feel I'm either not reaching or not reaching enough so that I know what kinds of professional development to pursue next. But I also wanted to talk about just in general, if you're an SLP who wants to get training to become an AAC specialist, then I would say that the topics you need to look for training on would include assessment, thinking about feature matching, vocabulary customization, goal writing and access needs, and then intervention, thinking about core vocabulary, modeling, supporting language and literacy development, as well as coaching. Coaching is its own sort of skill set. Um, you you kind of need to know about how to ask the right questions to lead people in the right direction, how to provide feedback and different feedback styles. So I do suggest training on that as well. And then devices. You'll want to know about a range of different high-tech apps, a range of access methods, various ways to do low-tech like pod and core boards and so on. Now, there are programs out there that claim to cover all of this stuff in one place and then provide you with an AAC certificate. I can't vouch for them personally because what I did was to take classes from all different places. And I think that can actually be a good thing because it gives you a variety of different perspectives. There's textbooks, you can take CEUs, there's some really great national conferences out there. Um, and I kind of just went for all of the above over time and, and continue to. And again, we'll have a, a set of resource links for you as well. So step 10 is to create a vision, a broader vision of what you want to see for your organization, knowing that this is going to be a long term process. So ask yourself, what is it that you want to see your children or clients be able to do? I'm on year five of a six year plan. I, I don't know how I came up with six years, but that's how long I thought it would take. <laughs> and this year, it's all about connecting AAC to STEM, improving our referral process through capacity building and improving our transition resources to our adult transition students. But that is not where we started, okay? Year one was just like, test everybody, teach everybody what AAC is, like just what the acronym means and what a device is, and that kids have to have it all day. It wasn't even until year two that I got to start teaching about people about what was on the devices or how to use them. And so we've really been able to accelerate compared to year one. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're building this, is that it will be a long-term process. So in summary, the things to think about are self-care, have a mentor, be loud about what you're doing, get organized, know your bureaucracy, inventory, assessment, consultation, professional development, and your overarching vision. So if you're in a place where you have an existing program, then this outline can become one of the ways that you evaluate your progress and look for places that your program might need a makeover or maybe even just a little touch up. And there's no way I could get through this presentation without mentioning the quality indicators for assistive technology or quiet. That's another great framework for evaluating progress. But on the other hand, if any or all of what I've talked about is brand new to you, like assessments or how to coach people, I have resource links to share. And the beautiful thing about evidence-based practice is that we don't have to reinvent the wheel and we don't have to worry that we're trying to do something impossible. Others have done it, so we know that it is possible even if it's difficult. Um, so to narrow down out of the whole world of AAC and AT resources, you know, what did I want to provide for you in the resource links list? The ones that I've chosen to highlight are all 100% free to access in keeping with the mission of AAC Accessible. Um, but I promise you that it's still high quality evidence-based information that I've personally reviewed, used, found to be helpful. So on top of that, I'm also here right now to answer any questions.
So um, Jennifer, if you want to start feeding me questions or yeah, I can like go through the list from, <laughs> from what was yeah, provided to me. Well, thank you so much for this. Um, so our first kind of question that we have, one from Marlene kind of asking about whether the resources are going to be shared at the end, um, which they will be. Um, that I think is the, that's our first main question, but everyone start spilling those questions. I'm sure we all have lots of ideas coming in our head. Um, maybe Brianna, could you, what prior to you kind of taking on this project, what was your role? Were you, yeah. Yeah. What was your role? What did your team look like? What's your support system in your school? Yeah. So before this, I was an SLP for one school site. And um, I also had some contact with some of the other school sites because um, within the first couple of years, they started having me do bilingual assessment for the district. And um, I had just a handful of AAC users at my site. And I started noticing that there really wasn't a lot of support for them outside of what I was providing for them. And um, because I sort of took an interest in this and started to take more training on it and learn about it further to help the kids I had in front of me, the district started feeding me more and more AAC users to my site. And yeah. so I kind of went to them and was like, hey, I could be doing this for everybody. <laughs> Would you be interested? And they said, we'd love that. Can you also be our AT specialist? I said, sure, let me get some training on that and then we'll make it happen. So I went and got an assistive technology certificate, did a bunch of training in AAC. And about a year later, after lots of prep, um, they hired me on as their AAC specialist. Very cool. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Jane asks, when you talk about AAC, are you meaning, um, oh, now the questions are coming in. <laughs> do you mean aided AAC or do you include unaided AAC? Um, for the most part in my role, I'm looking at aided AAC. I do have some students who are using ASL. Um, and for that, we also have a deaf and hard of hearing specialist. And so I work closely with her with those students. Um, so we have we have both, depending on the child. Uh, one question from Amy was, what suggestions do you have for school districts that say there is no uh, PD time in the calendar for trainings? Mm. Yes. That's a hard um, one. I, I, yeah, it is. It really is. Um, because so much of teachers' PD time is already taken up, if they have any at all, with you know other types of training. So they'll have to work on curriculum or they'll have to work on um, assessments or attendance or whatever it is. And so I think it's just having them understand that this is a huge priority for this group of teachers. Um, whoever that group of teachers is. For us, it's mostly our moderate, severe, and moderate SDC teachers, but we have everybody, is, you know, we've got kids in gen ed who are using AAC as well. So um, if someone says to me, you know, we don't have time for this, my question is, how can we make time? Okay. <laughs> because we have to, we have to make time to address the needs, the, the professional development needs of the teachers and to provide them with enough information to work with their students and to help the students meet their IEP goals. And if their IEP goals are around AAC, we're not doing our jobs if we're not fulfilling that. So that, that's kind of how I frame it for them. Yeah, I think that advocacy is very important. Yeah. Um, okay, our next question was, what assistive technology certificate did you get? I went through CSUN, which is um, Cal State Northridge, and they have a six-month certificate program for professionals who are already working in some area of rehab technology. Mm -hmm. So we had um, a huge group of variety of different folks. We had people who were rehab engineers and people who were OTs and people who were consumers and parents, and it was great. Um, there was a lot of good collaboration that happened through that program. Very cool. Okay. Um... So Marissa just asked, I am a program specialist, previously an SLP who is training in AEC, and I'm curious about how to move forward with building an AEC system in our county where there is mostly teletherapy SLPs and no AEC specialists, and only a few in-person SLPs in the country and county who have full caseloads. Wow, that's a lot. Um, so it sounds like in your role, you might be doing more capacity building as opposed to the kind of hands-on approach that I've taken with my district because I have a, a fairly small district. And so that could look like training all of the SLPs to recognize AAC needs to implement AAC um, technology. 
thankfully with, I mean, not thankfully, we had a pandemic, it was terrible, and it's still ongoing. But thankfully, one of the silver linings of that was that we saw that it really is possible to do AAC assessment and intervention effectively through telehealth. Um, it is possible to do assessments that involve the caregivers, which is the primary communication partner from the get-go, like being able to do an assessment with the parent there, I found amazingly helpful and it allowed them to get a sense of that assessment process and that feature matching process and, and to see it and not just hear about it later at an IEP. Um, it was something that we hadn't been able to do before and then were able to through that telehealth. Um, and then when you're providing therapy or intervention in the AAC population, a huge part of that is parent coaching. And so you can sort of shift your thinking from a direct therapy model as a speech therapist to a, yeah, I might be able to work directly with the student for a little while, but I probably also will be doing a lot of coaching throughout that process. So having real things in front of the kid and not just interacting with the screen, but having them interact with the parent and then coaching the parent. Um, is great because then that parent is gonna know and apply skills throughout the child's day, even when you're not there. Um, so there are ways to do it, but definitely thinking about a capacity building model um, so that you don't have to take on all of it, but that it is a whole, a whole team. Still there, Jennifer? I can't hear you. Uh-oh. Okay, here we go. Sorry. Um, yeah, Alice was asking, how does the technology department handle the apps and the devices? Oh, great question. Um, so we have a um, program through Apple. Ours is called JAMF. It's a weird name, J-A-M-F. Um, and it's a managed or a mobile device management system, MDM. And so each device that comes to us from Apple, they already associate the serial number with our settings. And so um, they're set up basically to be kind of locked down. They have internet access. It's not like a locked down device that you would get from Medicare or something like that. Um, but a lot of the settings are disabled just to make it so that it's safe for students to use. Um, and then that also allows us to track the devices locations. Um, which can be really helpful if something gets lost. Um, so yeah, and then they'll be able to push apps um, to the devices remotely, which is also a nice feature for our tech department to not have to have their hands on every device. Definitely. Um, any insights or suggestions for doing this in an early intervention setting, birth to three years old with a primary service provider model and parent coaching? Yeah, um, I, I think it's similar to Marissa's question where it's definitely going to be a capacity building thing of working with your SLPs. Um, there's some really great emerging evidence, um, research studies that have been done with this population to show that AAC plus speech therapy is more effective than speech therapy alone. Mm -hmm. So even treating it as kind of a universal intervention of we're at least going to provide low tech to everybody, some form of low tech to each of our kids could be a way to reach more of the kids who really need it and who may need it for the longer term and who will end up not developing verbal speech. So um, think of it as much as you can as like a universal intervention and as a capacity building intervention um, and that should help some. Okay. Um, next question is what do you provide in the way of trainings for parents? So, um, the initial conversations that we have happen during and immediately following the assessment process. So um, in the IEP meeting where I explain, this is the device that I'm thinking about recommending, um, this is why. I'll also go through a very long list of recommendations, which is included at the end of my report. Things like modeling and wait time and all of those key strategies that they're gonna need to know. So they have the information in a written format. Then there's a link to my website with a video of a video format of me talking through those things. And then there's another link in there of this is how you can get access to my calendar and set up appointments with me. So um, families can meet with me either with or without their child present. And then we'll do some training where we talk about what's on the device and how do we use it. And I like to get folks started with either 
a list of activities that they do every day at home or a list of core words that we're going to be targeting. And then we match those things together. And for some people, it makes more sense to think about, all right, we're going to have the core words go, stop, help more. How can I incorporate those a couple different ways throughout my day? And for other folks, that's like, no, I'm never going to remember that. Tell me how I can schedule it. So they'll, I'll ask them, you know, what does a typical day look like at home? And they'll explain, well, we get up, we have breakfast, we do this, we do that, and, the, and we'll go through their whole day. And then I'll say, okay, so during this activity, what if you added these core words that you're modeling? And during this activity, what if you add these core words? And, and they'll kind of take that in and, and be able to remember it and use it throughout the day. So there's different ways to kind of structure it. And again, there's lots of different ways to structure any sort of training or coaching, um, but those are kind of the general patterns. And then if we do follow-up sessions, I like to start any session with, you know, what do you want to talk about today? What are your questions? What do you want to make sure we cover? And then we'll get into whatever I had planned, whatever strategy I have planned. And as much as possible, providing them opportunities to practice with you present so that you can give feedback is really, really helpful. Awesome. Um, who would you recommend that I, I contact? No, uh, Destiny was asking, who would you recommend I contact? first to create a program from the ground up, your program specialist, special ed director, any suggestions? I think I would probably start with the special education director um, because this is something that is potentially going to be creating a new job title, a new position. And so they would be the ones who most likely would be involved with that. Program specialist roles differ from district to district a little bit, depending on where you are. Um, but generally speaking, I, I think I would go straight to the special education director with this one. Um, the next question is, what is your model for building capacity? The model for building capacity. Um, I think it's, it's a big question. <laughs> um, there's, like from an AT standpoint, when you're thinking about building capacity, you're thinking about how do I reach the largest number of kids and how do I kind of coach the coaches that will eventually go and see them. So I think what I think about is who has frequent contact with whom and how do we get the information to spread in the most efficient way possible. So I kind of picture like a, a tree in my head, if that makes sense with branches going out. So for instance, when I was thinking about capacity building during distance learning, I was able to have a lot of contact with staff members because we suddenly had a totally different model where my staff members suddenly had time set aside during the day for professional development, which was like, wow, this is great. So I had lots of contact with teachers, lots of contact with paraprofessionals. On the other hand, my SLPs suddenly had a ton of contact with families because all of their sessions, virtual sessions were organized with the parents. And so what I did was a kind of coach the coaches method of I would work with the staff and the SLPs would work with the families. Now we're back to in-person learning and it's the reverse. My SLPs have a lot more contact with staff members because they're on site, whereas I can have more contact and flexibility with families because my schedule allows me to move things around and, and switch things up so that I can meet their needs depending on their work schedule. So we flipped and the SLPs are doing more of the work with staff members and I'm doing more of the work with families. So I think it's identify who the other coaches can be and then think about that tree branch sort of model. How are you going to spread this information? This is amazing information. I'm taking notes myself. Um, okay, our next question is from Nicole. How do you maintain a manageable caseload? At what point in time, at what point is it time to add another AT specialist? I'm swamped with evaluations and not able to get into the classroom to work with the students and teachers like I need and want to. I have about yeah. 50 students on my AT caseload, public school districts, seven elementary schools, three middle schools, and two high schools. Ooh. Yeah, I feel you. <laughs> I've been there. I really have. Last year, my caseload was over 100 for most of the year, um, and it was rough. It was really rough. So um, I think this the answer differs depending on whether you're talking about an AAC specialist versus an AT specialist. Um, for an AT specialist in schools, the general rule of thumb, and it's kind of an odd way of thinking about it, depending on, you know, compared to other professions, but the general rule of thumb is one day per week per 10,000 students in the district. Now that sounds insane, right? <laughs> but you're not going to be actually 
physically seeing every single student. Most of the job of an AT specialist is going to be a few assessments for the low incidence kinds of cases. And then the majority of the time, the rest of your high incidence supports, your speech to text, text to speech, audiobooks, those students should be able to be served by the IEP teams without necessarily needing an AT assessment um, from an AT specialist, because those are supports that are really should be provided universally. Um, there are several great books on this topic that I brought home with me from the office from Chris Bugay. Yes, they are fabulous and a really great resource for how to do capacity building for overall AT programs. Now, an AAC specialist um, is a little bit different depending on where you're at. So you could do AAC in a capacity building type of model, or you could do it where it's more hands-on. And I have tried to keep mine a little bit more hands-on. I really want to still have that direct contact with the students and to be able to get to know them. And so what I've asked around to other colleagues in the area, they've said their absolute max is 75 for an AAC specialist. Um, and when you think about, okay, AAC is going to be an indirect consultation model versus an SLP is going to be a direct therapy model. If an SLP can do 55, maybe an AAC can do 75. It, it sounds about right to me. Um, and so that was the point at which I started advocating for more support. So um, this year, that caseload has been split up. So I now have, um, I started my year with 65 and I was full-time AAC. It's already up to 80 because we can't seem to stop the referrals from coming in this year, but I have somebody else with me one day a week. So that's helping. And then someone else took over the AT specialist role. So um, yes, I, I hear you. I'm with you. It's so hard because you, you have to start advocating as early as you can once you know that it's too many kids and also know that it's probably going to take your administrators a while to address it and to get you the help that you need. So hang in there. Okay, uh, another question from Heather. I realize there are a lot of nuances to this question, but there's many students in my caseload in addition to the role as the, okay, but how, how many students are in your caseload in addition to your role as the AAC specialist? Sounds so like I am a full-time AAC specialist, okay. actually. Okay. That, that's all I do at this point. Perfect. Um, okay. Whose email address do you use to back up the devices? Do you have a generic email address or Google account that's just for AEC? Oh, good question. So I have so far been using my district email address for this, um, but all of the files are in a set of folders that are shared with all of the admins. So worst case scenario, if something was to happen to my account, which I was very worried about when I changed my name, um, they would have ownership and access to those files so that they wouldn't get lost. Okay, um, related to the apps and iPad purchasing, my school district does their devices without Apple IDs, so we cannot get any app with an in-app purchase. Um, for example, TD Snap Pod can't be put on our iPads, which is really frustrating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have the same, or we had the same issue with our previous MDM. Our current one, my IT specialist is amazing this year. He found a way around it so that I could get pod with TD Snap. I don't know what kind of magic he did, and I wish I could tell you what it was. Um, but yeah, he's amazing. <laughs> okay. I am not in the school districts. I'm in a hospital setting, but um, for some of our devices, we we have used um, like gift cards um, for like a Google Play Store or for the iPad App Store, so that you didn't have to put a credit card on. So I don't know if that would be a suggestion for a smaller district. Yeah, or you might be able to contact the company. Um, I know that they they often provide. Um, free licenses to SLPs. So you mm -hmm. might be able to find some kind of work around that way. Yeah. Okay. So Andrea's question is, do the students in your caseload also work with a school-based SLP or just you? And how often do you see your students? 
Yeah, so um, they all have their school-based SLP and they'll have direct therapy minutes with that SLP. And then my services are on top of that. So it varies um, from student to student depending on how long they've had their device and how comfortable they are with it. Um, but generally I try to see everybody at least once a month. Usually it's more, especially for my early AAC users that have just gotten their first device. Um, Allison's asking, do you ever apply for grants for funding? Any successes? Um, so with my district, we have Medi-Cal grants that anybody within the special education department can apply for on top of whatever other funding you're getting. Um, I have had success with that. At this point, I haven't applied for outside grants. I know there are a few out there for AAC, especially um, for kids with apraxia of speech. There's there's grant funding available for that. Um, so haven't tried it, but it's out there. It doesn't seem to be any more um, questions right now in the in the chat. Uh, Brianna, did you have the list? I think there some people had pre given you some questions. Yes, yes. Um, so one of them was some quick and efficient ways for teachers to explore the devices that their students use. Um, so I think I talked a little bit about how I have videos for each app um, that describes like the colors, the color coordination on the app, the general route, what the folders do, how do I get access to more words, um, word finder, like how do I search for a word with the high-tech devices. So that's a really helpful resource for my staff members. I also have a set of core word of the day slides that any of my teachers can use. And um, this is basically designed to be just a five minute activity because each one has either a video or a book or some kind of real life activity that accompanies the core word. And so that's been distributed to all of them. And I find that's the thing that teachers are usually most comfortable implementing first. Um, they're fine with doing this like five minute add on to their morning meeting or their whole group activities. And then once they've learned maybe 20 or 30 of the words, they're like, oh, hey, I know where to find things. I can start doing this more often during the day. Um, so that kind of like eases them into using it um, on a more regular basis. I also create quick reference slides for each student that just has a picture of the AAC device. And then um, what are my top two or three suggestions for that child? And it'll also have the child's photo on there. Um, so this makes a great printout for sub plans, just in case a substitute teacher comes in. It makes a great little desk visual. Um, you can also do something like a communication passport. Um, if you've seen those where it provides a little bit of information about the AAC user um, to other people that are around them, either in the community or um, within the school. And then another tip is just to let everybody who's learning how to model on a device know that it's okay to mess up and that actually you want to let your AAC user see you mess up, say oops, and figure it out because your AAC user is also going to mess up need a way to say oops and figure it out. <laughs> um, so I think that helps people just kind of exhale, take the pressure off, you know, that they don't have to be perfect and they don't have to model complete sentences or grammatically correct sentences at first, especially with our brand new AAC users. It's totally okay if they're modeling just a couple of words at a time. Um, so I think that really helps them to feel a little better about getting started and about being a beginner at it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, Nicole was asking, do you have samples that we could see of the pages that you have for each student? Um, I don't have any that don't have confidential info on them. Um, so the best I can do is kind of describe them for you. Like I said, screenshot, couple lines of text, and then photo of the student in, in a corner. <laughs> Let's see, there were a couple of questions um, from beforehand that were asking about adults and um, working with adults with AAC. Um, I do work with some adults in our transition program, but it's a, it's a fairly small program. Um, and after age 22 is sort of outside of my expertise, or at least as far as I've done, you know, um, in the last couple of years. I do definitely see this as a growing area of need, especially with our population aging. Um, 
And so one of the things that I try to do is make sure that my students are not leaving my program without a privately owned device, whether that's funded through healthcare or through, in California, we have the Department of Rehabilitation uh, Voice Options Program, which is an awesome way to work with our state's AT Resource Center um, to get dedicated funding for devices. Um, when I've heard stories of successful adult programs, it typically comes from the healthcare setting, and it typically comes from places like the UK or Australia where they have universal healthcare that really covers the whole lifespan. Because we don't have an education system that covers the whole lifespan. It sort of becomes optional once you're an adult. You can come and go from the education system as you please, whereas healthcare is supposed to cover everybody. Um, so I, I do foresee that as being something that we will continue to need. There will need to be more folks in healthcare um, creating these opportunities for people who may have been missed when they were in school and always needed an AAC device, but now um, have finally heard of it and, and found the opportunity, so. Uh, Lisa was asking, how do you manage your inventory for your lending library? Do you use Google Sheets or what, what do you use? How do you manage it? Yeah, so um, there's a blog post that details all of that, um, but I basically just use Google Sheets because I'm in a small program. If you're in a big district or a multi-district kind of organization like a SELPA or a, um, a regional sort of system, you may want to look into actual inventory programs that are designed for that. Um, there's some really great articles out there from the business side of things, looking at how businesses manage their inventory that we can sort of borrow and adapt into our use case. Okay. That seems to be all for questions in the chat at this moment. Okay. Um, there was another one that came in from, I think it was a special education director asking, how do you change the lens of SLPs to see the need for a device to support communication in those who may eventually use speech? I love this question. I love that it's coming from somebody who's actually not an SLP themselves, but, but already recognizes the need. Kudos, first of all. Yeah. Um, so I, number one, would explain that AAC devices are providing more language input. No SLP is ever going to argue against providing more language input. It's not going to happen. Um, then I would appeal to research. Um, I, I referenced it before, but there's very good research showing that AAC doesn't ever reduce speech and even some emerging evidence to show that it can increase speech in the preschool and early intervention population. Um, and then I would probably talk about the parallels between speech therapy itself and AAC with speech therapy. There are so many parents who think, you know, let, well, let's just wait, they'll, they'll probably start talking on their own. And speech therapists will typically say, well, there's no harm in providing some speech therapy because yeah, maybe they will start talking on their own but will have prevented a potential problem if they weren't going to start talking on their own. So the same thing with AAC, we want to provide access to language just in case. And, um, you know, we don't have to say yes forever to AAC. We can just say maybe to it in the beginning. Um, and there's a great blog post out there from, I think it's Heidi Lestraco wrote about say maybe to AAC. So I think that's a great way to phrase it as well. Um, another one that came in was asking about where do I start if I have a district where there's no shared knowledge about AAC? And I can tell you I, that's more or less where I started too. I mean, we, like I said, we'd had no professional development for me or our teachers. Um, so some of them didn't know what AAC meant. Some of them didn't know what the role of an AAC specialist was. Um, I even had a teacher of a elementary moderate severe class say, oh no, all my kids are nonverbal. They don't need AAC. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so, so I can tell you that teacher by the end of that year, her entire class had AAC. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, you can start with just explaining what AAC means. And what you'll find is that you'll have early adopters, people who immediately see the usefulness and that this is going to be something that a lot of their students are going to need or a lot of their clients are going to need. But then there might be others that are a little slower to come around. The good thing is teachers all talk to each other and SLPs all talk to each other. So once you start to gain some traction with one group and you start to see some results with one group, 
other people will start coming to you. And then you'll reach a point like I have where the referrals are totally overwhelming <laughs> and you'll need to bring in more help. But that's a good thing because it means that awareness has increased. And so now you have a whole group of people that are working together towards that common goal of providing AAC to everyone who needs it. Um, um... So soon we are going to conduct a random name drawing for a free course on our learning platform. So just be uh, in a couple minutes. Okay. I think we have time for about one or two more questions. If anyone has anything, any burning questions. Referrals, a blessing and a curse. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly it. Um, so uh, several people asked about AAC assessment tools. Um, so the thing with AAC assessment is that there really aren't any standardized tests for this. So you're not going to have to think about budgeting for standardized tests the way you would for SLP assessments. What you're going to need to think about budget for, budgeting for is a lot of devices because you're going to want to be able to try different devices with your students or your clients. Um, many people use the SET process, which is student environment tasks and tools. Um, and I love the ideas behind that, especially for um, conversations about AT, but I actually use a totally different model for my assessment reports and the way that I have chosen to explain them to families. Um, and it's actually borrowed from school psychology. So it's called RIOT, R-I-O-T. And that's review, interview, observe, test, and trial. And the reason that I do that is because it makes it really easy to explain to families, what am I actually going to do? Not just what am I looking for when I'm going through this process? Because with my file review, I might find lots of information about the student, but I'm also gonna find lots of information through interview and lots of information through observation. So um, I find that that's just a really helpful way to organize my own thinking about what I'm gonna have to do to complete an assessment, but then also to organize the conversation around it. And then besides that, when we're talking about tasks with the set model, um, the, the general communication tasks tend to be pretty similar across people. We all need to make requests. We all need to make comments. We all need to ask questions and greet and um, all of those purposes of communication. So that's another reason that I use this other model. Um, there's lots of additional training out there to help you learn about AAC assessment and AAC assessment tools um, because it's a very dynamic process in many ways, sort of subjective. And the very unique thing about it is that so much of it involves the communication partner. We're not just assessing the communicator, but also their communication partner's knowledge and needs and how we can support them um, to create a full conversation, not just half of that conversation. Um, so lots of resources um, about that. Um, I see a question, how can we access the riot? There is no actual tool, that's just the, the model. So it's just an acronym that you can use to organize your report. Awesome. Uh, somebody was asking, do you ever get pushback from letting kids bring their own devices because the district is afraid that they will be responsible for replacing it if it's broken at school? Probably like an insurance funded device. Hmm. So far, I have not had that concern come up. I've had okay. some families say that they didn't want to send their home device for that reason. And I would say totally fine. You know, it's yours and, and you don't have to. Um, we'll provide the school funded device in that case. Um, so if that comes up, I would, you know, maybe talk to your administrator about, can we come up with some sort of agreement with the family or some sort of form that they can fill out that says, we're okay with sending this. We understand that it's our device, but you know, that things happen. Um, yeah, that's where I would start okay. with that conversation. Awesome. Okay, one last question. Um, any specific suggestions to get through the teachers who are so resistant to facilitating AAC with their students saying that it's the SLP's job? Mm, okay. Um, so I would start by mentioning that communication happens all day, that we don't just talk when we're in speech therapy. We also talk all day long. And when we talk to our students, 
we are forming a relationship with them. And I think that's something that's important to every teacher is to have relationships with their students. Um, and then on top of that, talking about how if we only got a half an hour twice a week of language input, how much of that language would we be able to learn? And you can make the comparison to picking up a new language. Um, if you wanted to suddenly learn, I don't know, Mandarin and you didn't speak Mandarin before, how much time do you think you would need if you only had half an hour twice a week and you never practiced in between? Kids really need lots of exposure. And then think about your learner. Does your learner need one repetition of a new concept or do they need many? And if they need many, we need to be providing that all day long. So there's lots of examples that you can pull from to kind of show teachers the importance of this. Um, but I like to especially call attention to, don't you love it when your kid has something to say that you could never have predicted they would have said? Like, isn't that fun? Because <laughs> it really is. I find it fun. Um, and, and showing them that it can be a joyful experience to bring this into their classroom. Yeah, I think that's, that's the point of our jobs is to give them yeah. the power to speak their minds. And yeah. often it's not what we've ever thought they were thinking. Oh yeah. I mean, I had a therapy session one time where we were going to talk all about pets and fuzzy animals and this little boy comes in and what does he want to talk about? Bugs, bugs, mm -hmm. <laughs> all about bugs. That's what we did that day because that's what he wanted to talk about. Yes. I've learned the days that <laughs> I have. And that's why he had AAC, right? To be able to tell me that. Mm -hmm. The days that I have the best in my mind lesson plans are the days that the kids have their own plan and they want to talk about poop or they want to tattle on their siblings and mm -hmm. um, giving them the opportunity to have those same experiences that we did as kids, I think is so important as well. Oh, for sure. For sure. And also to let us know when they are sort of different from other kids. Like I had, um, I was co-teaching with an SLP one time who had a lesson plan for making lemonade. Super fun. Um, most of the kids were like more, more, more to the sugar. We had this one kiddo that was like, no, no more, <laughs> no more. We're like, oh, two word phrase. Yes. <laughs> but also okay you like it sour cool <laughs> yeah um lisa had one more question do teachers ever ask you the co-plan or co-teach to show them how to integrate the device into the classroom yes and i actually love doing that because it's such a great way to provide coaching with something that they're already doing so in that case what i would ask them to do is tell me what their lesson plan is for the day and i'm going to add aac as a layer onto that um, so that way they're still taking ownership of the lesson but it's adding the communication onto the content. I think that's probably the most effective way versus me bringing in some sort of new material that's not necessarily with the curriculum they're already using. Um, I want us to have conversations about grade level topics, about you know, things that are happening in the classroom, in the real world of the student's life, not have to bring in additional lesson plans just for communication. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with having a separate communication time. That's what speech therapy can be. But in order to integrate it across the day, we need to talk about we need to talk about things all day. So that, that's another great way to illustrate for teachers, you know, that this can be part of their classroom. Uh, another question from Allison: Can you type out the riot acronyms? Yes, definitely. Let okay. me just pull the chat up real quick. It awesome, was, thank you. Yeah. Review interview. Oops. Sorry, my screen went funny. Um, observe and tests and trials. All right, as we wrap up, I'm just gonna go ahead and let you all know who won our freebies, our giveaways. So the first winner is Adina, who is still here. Um, yeah, Adina, if you're interested in taking a free class on our online platform, you can email me at Tana. I'm going to type it in the chat at accessible.org, and I will take your info and get you going with that. And I'm going to draw one more name before we thank Brianna for her time and say good night for the evening. Second winner is Judy. Judy, are you still here? I don't know if Judy's here. Let me pull up my participants and see. 
Judy is here. So Judy, if you are interested in a free class on our platform, just go ahead, awesome, and email me at tana at accessible.org and we'll get you set up. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Jennifer, to close us out. Huh. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate all of your questions and Brianna for providing us with all your knowledge. Um, we also are still currently accepting papers for our presentation, um, not presentation, for our conference in February. So if anyone is interested in presenting, um, it's something maybe is a bucket list item and they want to present. Last year was the first time I had ever done a presentation um, and uh, it wasn't too bad. And now I'm coming back for more. So, um, you know, it's a good opportunity to provide other knowledge. So, well, everyone, um, Brianna, do you have anything else you'd like to share? No, I just want to thank everyone so much for being here, for your wonderful questions, um, for the discussion that I can see that went on in the chat with people providing suggestions to each other. Um, it's just so wonderful to be part of this AAC community, and I appreciate each and every one of you. Awesome. Well, everyone, have a great evening. Thank you.